Welcome to the Introduction to Correlated Materials, a series of lectures to help you understand and admire the role of electron-electron interactions in solids, brought to you by Schrodinger's Kittens Productions. Lecture 3 The Mott Transition in degenerately doped semiconductors. In the last lecture, we introduced the Mott Hubbard band structure. And we showed that either by tuning the spacing between the atoms which in turn affects the bandwidth or by tuning the Coulomb repulsion between the electrons which we called U we could cause a transition between metallic and insulating states. And specifically, the case where we have a large Coulomb repulsion, a large U, tends to give an insulator, and if we have a large bandwidth corresponding to a small spacing between the atoms, this will give a metal. This time, we're going to look at one specific example of such a Mott transition. And that's the case of the Mott transitional transition in degenerately doped semiconductors. I want to begin though by briefly reviewing, just as a reminder, doping in semiconductors in general. And let's take the example of an n-type semiconductor, for example, phosphorus in silicon. So if we think of each silicon atom as being a silicon four plus nucleus with four valence electrons, then each of our silicon atoms bonds to four other silicon atoms with each of its electrons pairing up to form a covalent bond. Of course, in, in reality, this is in, in three dimensions. I'm drawing it in two dimensions just for simplicity. When we put in a phosphorus atom instead of a silicon, the phosphorus has five valence electrons. So we can treat that as a phosphorus five plus ion with four valence electrons that form covalent bonds with the near neighboring silicons, but then with one extra electron left over. And this extra electron will be somewhere in the silicon lattice, 
and bound to the phosphorus ion because the phosphorus is more positively charged than the surrounding silicons. We can map this picture instead of having a five plus phosphorus ion surrounded by four plus silicon ions, we can map it into a picture where we have a single positively charged ion with its electron in a background described by the dielectric constant of the silicon. Again, because the phosphorus has an extra charge of plus one compared to silicon. And this picture that we've mapped into is a particularly convenient picture because of course it looks very much like the Schrodinger equation for a hydrogen atom, which we know how to solve. So let's do that and solve the Schrodinger equation for a hydrogen atom and then modify it for our specific case of a phosphorus atom in silicon. And what we're aiming for here is to work out what the radius is of the electron in the phosphorus doped silicon, because that's going to tell us how far, how strongly interacting the electrons are with each other. Okay, so remember that the Schrodinger equation for a hydrogen atom is described by a potential equal to the Coulomb potential, which is minus e squared over four pi epsilon zero r. And when we substitute that into the Schrodinger equation, we obtain, I'm not gonna work out the solution, we just write it down, that the wave function for the 1s atomic orbital, the lowest energy atomic orbital, is two over a zero to the three over two, e to the minus r over a zero, where this parameter a zero is equal to four pi epsilon zero h bar squared divided by the mass of the electron times the electronic charge squared. And the most probable radius for the electron is at the maximum in the prob probability distribution function, P of R, which is given by P of R dr equal to the wave function squared times R squared dr. And this is equal to A zero. So for a hydrogen atom with its positively charged nucleus, the most probable place for finding the electron, the most probable radius is at a distance A zero from the nucleus. If we extend this now to the case of a phosphorus atom in silicon, We just showed that the picture is very similar, but in this case now we have, instead of a positively charged hydrogen nucleus in the vacuum, we have a phosphorus ion embedded in a silicon lattice. And the most probable radius we call this time the hydrogenic radius, A sub H. Our potential changes from the potential for a hydrogen atom because the additional positive charge is now screened 
by the dielectric constant of silicon, so the potential is reduced by one over the dielectric constant of silicon. And the other change, of course, is that the effective mass of the electron is not the free electron mass, but the effective mass of an electron in silicon. And so our hydrogenic radius, instead of being a zero, is four pi epsilon zero times the dielectric constant of silicon, h bar squared, divided by the effective mass of the electron in silicon times e squared. And our lowest energy, I'll put psi 1s in, in quotes because it's not exactly a 1s orbital of hydrogen, is now 2 over the hydrogenic radius to the 3 over 2 e to the minus r over a sub h. So that's the real space picture for our electron that's introduced into the silicon lattice by the phosphorus doping. Now let's take a look at the band theory picture. So the band structure of the silicon, which is hosting the phosphorus atoms, we know consists of a valence band, which is filled, separated by a band gap from the conduction band, which is empty. And the band gap is quite large. It's around an electron volt because it corresponds to pulling an electron out of one of those silicon-silicon bonds, which is a strong covalent bond. This scale is energy. The extra electron though, which is bound to the phosphorus atom, is only rather loosely bound. It experiences a Coulomb attraction to the phosphorus ion, but this is screened by the dielectric constant of the silicon. And so its energy level is sitting just below the edge of the conduction band. And this is a small energy corresponding to pulling the electron off of the phosphorus atom and putting it into the conduction band of the silicon host. And with this band structure, we can understand our usual semiconducting behavior. In which carriers are introduced into the conduction band as a function of temperature. So again, to remind you what the number of carriers in the conduction band N looks like as a function, it's usually plotted as reciprocal temperature. So temperature is increasing in this direction. At low temperature, as temperature is increased, the number of carriers increases. And this corresponds to the carriers getting excited off the impurity atoms into the conduction band. And then there's a region of temperature. As the temperature increases, the number of carriers doesn't really go up very much. This is the saturation region where all the dopants are ionized. All of the phosphorus ions have already lost their electrons into the conduction band until a very high temperature, a temperature is corresponding to the band gap. Then the carry concentration goes up again. And this is what's called the intrinsic region 
where we have electron hole excitation across the gap. And at higher doping concentration, if we had more dopants, then this whole curve would shift up. So higher dopant concentration, there'd be more carriers excited off the impurity atoms before we reach the saturation region. And then eventually, again, at very high temperature, intrinsic electron hole excitation across the gap occurs again. So this is a higher doping concentration. until the doping concentration becomes so high that we reach what's called the degenerate regime. And in that regime, the number of carriers as a function of temperature is approximately constant. And this is called the degenerate regime. So it's the degenerate doping concentration and it usually corresponds to doping concentrations of greater than roughly 10 to the 18 per centimeters cubed. So the blue curves here are all showing normal semiconducting behavior. behavior that's exploited in semiconductor devices. And the black curve here is the degenerate regime. And in this degenerate regime, the wave functions of the electrons on the doping atoms have started to overlap and make a band. So the band structure in the degenerate regime looks like this. If we look at the density of states as a function of energy, then Again, we have the filled valence band, the empty conduction band, but there's now an impurity band. Formed by the overlapping wave functions of the electrons introduced by the dopants and because each dopant atom introduces one state and one electron, this impurity band is half filled. And so, so in a conventional band theory picture, this is a half filled band and it should be metallic. At all temperatures. But of course, as we discussed last time, if the Coulomb repulsion between the electrons becomes greater than the bandwidth, then we might expect an insulator. And remember the bandwidth depends on the separation between the atoms. which is proportional to the 
dopant density to the minus a third and the Coulomb repulsion depends on the size of the dopant atomic orbitals. The Coulomb repulsion is the repulsion experienced by two electrons in the same atomic orbital. And so if the orbital is very small, there's a very large Coulomb repulsion. And this can be quantified. In fact, Mott showed that the solid should be metallic when the concentration of donor atoms to the cubed root times the hydrogenic radius is greater to than or approximately equal to a quarter. So this tells us if we have fewer dopants or we have a smaller hydrogenic radius, our system should be insulated. Okay, so let's have a look at some data. And I want to look specifically at two examples. So here's our first example. And in the first example, we're going to keep the hydrogenic radius constant. This is an experiment which is done for a sample of phosphorus in silicon at a single doping concentration. And so if the hydrogenic radius is constant, then the Coulomb repulsion is approximately constant also. And U is kept constant but the doping concentration is varied by changing the volume. And so in this case, stress is applied to the sample. And so the doping concentration is varied by changing the volume through applying stress. And because the doping concentration is varied, then the bandwidth is also varied. And here by the bandwidth, of course, we're talking about the width of this extra impurity band, which is formed by the doping ions, which I've sketched here. So this experiment was done, the, the silicon was doped with phosphorus. So it was in the degenerate regime. It was a high doping concentration but it was just on the insulating side of the metal to insulate a transition. So it was an insulator and stress was used to increase or decrease the carry concentration. We should point out that these measurements were done at very low temperature. In fact, this was done below 100 millikelvin because of course at high temperature, um, the band gap that opens in the impurity band because of correlations is very small and the system just becomes a dirty metal at all, all, all temperatures. So let's look at what we're, we're, we're looking at here. On the left hand y axis is plotted one over the dielectric susceptibility. And the dielectric susceptibility diverges in a metal. And so as one over the dielectric susceptibility approaches zero, that's an indicator of a, approaching the metal insulator transition. So these dots here are measures of the reciprocal dielectric susceptibility in the insulating regime. 
And we see that as the atoms are moved closer together, the system starts to approach becoming metallic. So as we've moved down in this direction, the atoms have pushed closer together. One over the dielectric susceptibility is going down towards zero. The susceptibility is diverging. So the system is moving towards being a metal. The x-axis is the, num the doping concentration measured relative to the critical doping concentration between the insulator and the metallic regime. And so in the direction to the left, the phosphorus atoms are moved further apart. And N goes down. And going to the right, the phosphorus atoms are closer together. And the doping concentration is going up. And the dashed vertical line is indicating the transition between the insulating and the metallic regime. On the right hand axis is plotted the conductivity. And the black dots are indicating the conductivity. And we see that as the atoms are moved closer together, the conductivity is increasing. So we see exactly what we expect when the atoms are far apart and the bandwidth is small, the system is an insulator. As the atoms move closer together, it becomes a less good insulator. Its dielectric constant is increasing, indicating an approach to metallicity. And at some critical dopant concentration, it undergoes an insulator to metal transition at first, it's a rather bad metal with low conductivity, but then as the atoms are pushed closer together, the conductivity is increasing as it moves more into the metallic regime. And again, to emphasize here, this is all the same system. It's phosphorus atoms in silicon. So the hydrogenic radius, the Coulomb repulsion between the electrons is kept constant, and all that's varied is the dopant concentration. Next, we'll look at a, a second example. In which the hydrogenic radius is varied by changing the host semiconductor. And this is really a, a survey of very many examples. And remember again, the hydrogenic radius is four pi epsilon zero, epsilon of the host semiconductor, h bar squared over e squared m star. And so when we have a large hydrogenic radius corresponding to a large dielectric constant, a small effective mass. This means that we have wide bands with a very covalently bonded semiconductor and a small u. So when we have a large hydrogenic radius, we expect metallic behavior at lower dopant concentration. So here's a collection of the measured critical concentration, concentration at which the system 
makes a transition between the insulator at low concentration and the metal at high concentration as a function of the effective radius. So a few things to notice here. The first thing is that the plot of the hydrogenic radius versus the log of the critical concentration to the transition gives us a straight line. And the fact that this is a straight line tells us that this MOT criterion is satisfied And you can see it's satisfied over a really remarkable range of concentrations from 10 to the um, 14 to 10 to the 22 per centimeter cube. So the MOT criterion is satisfied over a concentration range of around 10 to the 9 per cubic centimeter. That gets an exclamation mark. Okay, and then let's have a look at some specific trends. If we first take a look at indium antimonide and, and tin telluride, these are extremely covalent, covalent semiconductors. They have a very small band gap, very large dielectric constant, and a very large hydrogenic radius and we see that they become metallic already at very low doping. Again as we'd expect from the MOT criterion. Silicon and germanium have smaller dielectric constants than indium antimonide and tin telluride. They're still very covalent semiconductors, but um, less polarizable than 3,5 indium antimonide and, and, and tin telluride. They have smaller dielectric constant and slightly larger band gap than indium antimonide and tin telluride and so they have a larger effective radius and they become metallic at higher concentration and in terms of their ordering, silicon has a lower dielectric constant than germanium and a smaller hydrogenic radius and so becomes metallic. at higher concentration. I see a typo here. It shouldn't be larger hydrogenic radius, but smaller, I'm sorry. They have a smaller dielectric constant and they also have a smaller hydrogenic radius. The last um, materials that I want to point out over at this end, these are what are called expanded metals. These, of course, are not conventional semiconductors at all. 
there would be, for example, solutions of alkali metals in liquid ammonia. So they have very narrow bands. And very strong Coulomb interactions, very large U, and so they need very high concentrations to become metallic. Okay, so we see in both our examples here, whether we vary the hydrogenic radius and vary the U, or whether we vary the spacing between the dopant atoms and vary the bandwidth, the Mott criterion for the transition between a metal and an insulator is satisfied in both cases. Okay, so we've seen how really very striking example how the electron-electron-coulomb electron interaction really requires an extension to the simple band theory picture. In the simple band theory picture, all of the situations that we've looked at would be metallic at all temperatures and all concentrations. The electron-electron Coulomb interaction can cause systems that band theory predicts to be metallic to be insulating. What we're going to do next time is formalize this mathematically. And we'll extend our linear combination of atomic orbitals Hamiltonian that we're very familiar with to include the electron-electron Coulomb interaction in what's called the Hubbard Hamiltonian. Thanks for listening.